What is arm type? What do I type for arm type? T-Rex arms. This is my beautiful uh, dragon rider OC with T-Rex arms. There's a completely relevant plot reason for why she has these. She's also very beautiful and she doesn't realize how special she is. And she's ashamed of her T-Rex arms. But there's that special heterosexual guy and he thinks her tiny arms are the most beautiful arms of all. Hey there, Internet. I'm Annie. I'm Kit. And I'm Mac. And this is I Will Fight You, a podcast where we've been turning opinion into Stone Cold Facts since 1986. Today's Stone Cold Fact, Jupiter Ascending deserves to be in the cinematic canon. Now, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably know what Jupiter Ascending is, but there's a possibility that you don't. This is a movie that is written, produced, and directed by the Wachowskis. Have we officially switched over to the Wachowski sisters yet? The other Wachowski also came out as transgender, so The Matrix is officially written and directed by two transgender women, and it's awesome. And here's the thing, Jupiter Ascending is absolutely a movie made by women for little girls who are nerds. Yes, this is 100% what this is. It gets a lot of flack for being adolescent and indulgent and kind of dumb, but it's no more that than, say, your Ender's Game, which is a story about a little boy who's so intelligent that he's bullied about it because they just don't understand him and they're jealous of him. Then he gets selected to go to a special school where he gets to play video games all day, only he's too good at video games. He starts to threaten the establishment, man, and then he accidentally commits genocide, but it's not really his fault. It's all the grown-ups' fault. And that's the end of the book. So uh, compared to that, Jupiter Ascending is pretty standard. I compare Jupiter Ascending a lot in story structure to My Immortal, at least the first half of My Immortal, where the theory is pretty solid that this is like original content that is written without being self-aware. This whole thing reads like a fan fiction. It is, it's structured narratively like a fanfic where you start with your, with your Mary Sue with an improbable name who's very special, but even though people tell her all the time she's special, she doesn't realize it. And then she has a whole bunch of adventures in different places with a lot of hot people. As soon as we wrap up one plot with that hot person, we move on to a completely separate one where we only make vague references to the previous chapter. I mean, plot. And then we have a story beat so nice we do it twice. You know, like in My Immortal when, uh... When you have to go see a concert with Gerard Way twice. Exactly! My Chemical Romance and Good Charlotte played two concerts in Hogsmeade twice. A lot of people have also said they have no idea how this movie was made by the same people who made The Matrix. And honestly, I've read some really, really good analysis looking at The Matrix as transgender analogy. And if you look at The Matrix through that lens, then you can actually draw a straight line between that and Jupiter Ascending. If the Matrix is about rejecting an identity that's been assigned to you, then Jupiter Ascending is about claiming uh, your true identity. There's repeated references to the word claim in this. It's not about Jupiter becoming this person. It's the idea that she's always been this person and she's just trying to get that recognized. Huh. That is an interesting line. I can absolutely see that. I like that read of it. It's not the worst movie ever. It's actually pretty clever in some places, but it's also ridiculous and wonderful and baffling and we should get into this. It's ridiculously campy and I kind of love it. So here's some background for me. I saw this movie in first in what I consider to be its purest form on an airplane. I started this movie. I got in about 15 minutes. I grabbed John's arm, I pointed at the screen, and I told him what had happened so far. Within the next two minutes, he had switched his screen to Jupiter Ascending, and I started over so we could watch together. And we had to keep pausing the movie to ask each other what the hell we were looking at. I saw this movie on opening day. I was in Phoenix, which is a nowhere place at the time, visiting some family. I went to go see this movie with my mother and my grandmother. All three of us have hearing problems, and a lot of the characters spend most of this movie whispering. Easily 50% of the dialogue I did not realize was there until I watched it on DVD this week. Me, I'd of course seen some trailers in the movie theaters and I'd just kind of written it off until I read a review, which I actually took the time to look up last night so that I could find it again. And it didn't have me until I got to the part where it describes the film's plot. And this is from The Nerdist, so just giving clarity there. A miserable toilet scrubber named Jupiter is rescued from a team of alien gynecologists by a half-man, half-wolf, and flying boots who informs her that Earth is owned by a sniveling bastard named Balaam. And I was like, yes. 
I want to watch this now. And that is all entirely accurate. Not a single word of that is a lie. As we describe this movie, it's going to sound like we're just making stuff up. I need you to know that we're not making any of this up. Technically speaking, I'm an alien. (laughs) A good 20% of my notes are just writing down word for word what just happened on screen and writing down the line because I couldn't believe what was coming out of people's mouths. And then Jupiter follows that up with, and from the perspective of immigration, an illegal one. And before you get too excited about this movie having a Latina main character, no, this is a movie about Mila Kunis. Who's Russian. Mila Kunis herself is Ukrainian, but she plays a Russian girl in this movie. She plays half Russian, half Jarvis. Jupiter's parents met in St. Petersburg. Her father taught astrophysics and her mother taught applied mathematics at the university. Her parents are Edwin Jarvis and Siobhan Sadler. That is where you know those actors from. In the meantime, his name is Maximilian Jones, and he's the son of an English diplomat who always saw the best in people. Jupiter says, I often wonder if what happened changed me from someone who always sees the best in people to someone who always expects the worst. Get ready for a lot of this sort of telling you what the character's personality is. I also want to point out that we never see this expecting the worst from people in practice from Jupiter. Nope. It is all tell, no show. And what could happen? What could be what happened to her parents, to her very pregnant mother and her dad who does things? Some people break in and try to rob them and then he ends up shooting Jarvis. The freaking, I thought this was the freaking mafia, but I guess it's just a very random armed robbery. By guys in black tactical gear. I guess this happens in Russia. They just break down the door in the middle of a crowded apartment building. And they exploded with all these amazing guns and they just shoot him for no reason. And it's just supposed to affect Jupiter and she's still like a fucking fetus. Dad's like... Don't take thy telescope, no! And then they shoot him, and he dies instantly. Completely random. This is never touched upon in the movie ever again. No narrative significance or interest, nothing that'll come back. No, it's just, and then my dad was randomly murdered. Oh my god. Jupiter's mom then just gets on a boat and goes to America and has a baby in the middle of the Atlantic. My mother pushed everyone except her sister out of her life, and somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, she pushed me out too. The two halves of this analogy don't fit. I was born without a country, without a home, without a father. And she was also born astrologically aligned with Jupiter. According to my aunt, that means I am destined for great things and that I will meet the one true love of my life. Which, I mean, I'm pretty sure astrology says about anybody. That's that's the case for everybody. And then it cuts to Jupiter cleaning a toilet and says, think about astrology? Total bullshit. Somebody once told me. But wait, no, we have to cut before we get to the lol my life montage. We actually have to have another scene before that. Yeah, the funny thing about this movie is that a lot of movies with this plot premise will just do the normal girl stuff up until the reveal that holy shit there's aliens. This movie keeps cutting away to the space opera plot within the first two minutes. So there's a lot of characters saying really cryptic things that nobody is expected to understand on a first viewing. Let's go listen to some people in fancy outfits murmur at each other. This is one of those scenes where I got got none of the dialogue. I had no idea what was happening. I had like a plane droning on in the background, so a lot of this was just nonsense to me. Yeah, the the sound design in this always irritates me and I always have to have the uh anytime I watched it I watched it like five times I have to have the remote control right next to me just because I have to pump it up one second because friggin Eddie Redmayne is sitting there whispering really quietly and then I have to pump it down the next moment because there's a roller skate fight where people are shooting things and it's super loud Academy Award winning actor Eddie Redmayne is in this movie and spends the entire two hours either whispering or screaming so let's meet these characters we've got Two people in very fancy outfits wandering around an empty city in the middle of some planet. They say there's been some kind of a harvest, and even without the subtitles, you can hear the capital letter in harvest. Yep, the entire planet is covered in blue crystals, which is never explained or touched on again. And also there's a bridge on this planet that's identical to a bridge in London, and I know this because they use the exact same shot of that bridge in Sense8. And uh, let's, let's not ignore the fact that this is a scene where all three of these characters, who are siblings, talk like this all the time. Can we just talk about this movie as though we are the characters? 
of this Abraxas family. I don't think we've got the time. Everyone speaks so slowly and with very little enunciation because we're all wasps who are singing bobs at each other very, very passive aggressively. And then there's Balem, who either talks like this or like this! This is the best movie ever made. Okay, so uh, one of our characters is like, Oh, Mother had a beautiful planet that was named... And the audience is like, Earth, it's Earth, it's Earth, it's Earth, it's, it's Earth, it's Earth, it's Earth. Earth. <gasps> yes, this beautiful jewel of a planet has a name that translates directly to dirt. Apparently Balem owns Earth. And the girl who is named Kalik and the boy who is named Titus just really want it, but it's really expensive. And then they just sort of like ollie out of the scene. Yeah, they all teleport out. And then we get back to Jupiter's world. It's 4.45 a.m. And she and her family all live together in a small room. And Jupiter says, I hate my life. A lot. She says it a lot. And finally, finally, we get a miserable life montage. And it is not scored by All Star. On the one hand, I feel like that would have been thematically appropriate. On the other hand, I'm really glad I didn't have to listen to All Star again. Jupiter and her aunt and her mom are all maids. They clean very pretty houses. Houses that Jupiter goes around looking at all the glamorous stuff in those houses and, and, and holding up earrings to her ears and holding dresses up to herself and fantasizing about the life she could have but never will have and yeah. Yeah, that's not gonna be a thing later. Don't worry about it. Then, at night, in the Chicago skyline, here comes a mysterious Channing Tatum wandering down a dark alley. And then we get three more mysterious figures watching him from a rooftop and commenting that he's a quote-unquote lichentent. And every time you hear lichentent in this movie, I want you to hear space werewolf. Here are the garbage words they use to describe Channing Tatum. And by the way, I don't bother with his name in any place in my notes. Really? Because his name is hilarious. I know, but I just keep thinking about Channing Tatum. He is a lycantant, a hunter, ex-legion, and a skyjacker. And then the bounty hunters comment that he's after our bounty. And then we cut to the inside of the clinic, and the first proper shot we get of Channing Tatum in this movie that isn't like in silhouette is him sniffing a piece of paper. It's that kind of movie, folks! And let's also mention that... The bounty hunters? The Korean actress looks like she just came out of a rave in the year 2002. She's got enormous purple and black dreadlock pigtails. And she's got gigantic goggles. Then we've got a white guy with an incredible monocle who looks like he just came from a steampunk convention. And then we've got this other guy who they took like a black actor and then like layered on even blacker makeup on him and his beard and mohawk are both made of feathers. Then Channing Tatum notices that he's being tailed. So he pulls up a kinetic shield, a gun, and then he starts hovering off the ground. He has gravity, space, flying rollerblades, and he uses them for the rest of the movie. And then we get a fight scene where we find out that that gun he's got barks like a dog. All throughout this fight scene, we've got, like, techno arf arfs going off. It's amazing. Meanwhile, let's check in on the autumn planet somewhere. Here comes Kalik, who is legit talking to someone named Maledictus, who looks like he just walked out of Andrew Lloyd Webber's Cats. The scene is like 30 seconds long, but this is the part of the movie where we start seeing what is the true strength of it, which is ridiculously pretty and also impractical costume design. I honestly really love all the costumes that are in this show. This movie has so many excuses for Jupiter to just put on a pretty dress, which, by the way, is very much a fanfic sort of thing. And I do not begrudge it because I want to have the opportunity to change to a bunch of pretty dresses. A lot of the visuals are just fabulous in this movie. Like, if you just cut out like the sound and set back you could be entertained by just watching the prettiness go on there is so much to look at in any given frame of this movie it's almost painterly in how crowded it is this entire scene is just something something make a deal with bounty hunters something something and then it's over and then we switch back to the other space opera where a wormhole opens outside jupiter jupiter the planet not jupiter the person yeah that's gonna get confusing later and then balam just fast times at ridgemont highs out of his own private pool and the ship flies into a little hole they made in the red spot on Jupiter. 
And uh, he arrives at a space station in Jupiter, although, I don't know, it's it's a refinery, apparently. Some kind of, like, factory inside the planet. The point is that he arrives on this hover sled that has a lady on the front that this is not explained at all, or even discussed, or commented on. The important thing is, Balem looks as fantastic as possible. He is always draping himself over furniture to be as fabulously aloof as he possibly can. Basically, Eddie Redmayne realized that he was in a movie that was based basically a fanfic and he just decided to go with it. Yeah, he really leaned into this whole thing. And Eddie Redmayne is greeted uh, at the refinery by a little rat dude and a whole bunch of dragons. The dragons are never explained. They're just there. There's just dragons in this movie. They look like draconians from Dragonlance slash like, what is that, like third edition or something? They're dragonborn. And someone says, and I'm just glossing over here because this is another scene in which there are a lot of stupid words thrown at us. They've done a gene print match and there's been a recurrence and they have a name, Catherine Dunleavy. Which you may notice is not the name of our protagonist. There's a reason for that. It's cool. Catherine Dunleavy is going to show up and she's only in one scene. And she's in her underwears. And uh, apparently she's actually got a pretty close relationship with Jupiter because she asks her for advice on this wealthy, eligible bachelor that's going to ask her to marry him. Catherine is older than Jupiter? Vaguely, but not discernibly older. And she is Jupiter's friend? Employer? Well, it's implied that Jupiter uh, cleans her house, at least. I don't know. And then she's like, Jupiter, have you ever fallen in love? And then Jupiter's like, well, uh, my mom says that love is a fairy tale for little girls, probably because the one love of her life was gunned down in a random act of violence in Russia. Really, it's all just urges and obligations. There's there's a lot going on there that we never really get to discuss at all. It's much like many other things just kind of dropped. Jupiter is trying to get a, a fancy dress out of a closet for, for her very best friend and constant confidant Catherine Dunleavy. Some legit little gray men just show up and like attack Catherine. Yeah, they like knock her unconscious and use hover things to like lift her up into the air so they can chest her gene print only a little light goes red, which is a bad thing apparently. And then as Jupiter's trying to take a stealth photo of these guys, her phone goes off and they see her. And then they both wake up, but they don't seem to remember anything. But Jupiter's looking at her phone and squinting suspiciously. Anyway, let's have dinner with the family. They're a bunch of Russians. And uh, they are incredibly stereotypical. The patriarch of this family is like, he's her cousin? He's wearing a track outfit. And Jupiter's mom keeps referring to uh, said cousin patriarch as Stalin, despite the fact that I don't think she's old enough to remember him personally. And not only is this patriarch a tremendous asshole, but he's also a sexist douche. Because he says, Jupiter, you're a smart girl. That's probably why you're not married. <laughs> Which starts a huge fight with the whole family and involves Siobhan Sadler threatening to shove a latkey up uh, the patriarch's ass which I kind of love. Jupiter wanted in advance on her allowance or payment or something, but she won't tell them what the money's for. And then we find out what the money's for. We cut to an eBay listing of a telescope. Another character comes down the stairs and asks Jupiter if she's having second thoughts. This is her cousin Vladdy, although you can be forgiven for not knowing his name for because we do not learn it for a while. We don't learn his name until we're about, like, ass deep in space opera. And uh, it turns out that Vladdy has coerced Jupiter into agreeing to sell her eggs. She gets 5k and he gets 10k. Jupiter makes reference to the fact that the paperwork calls it harvesting because this movie is nothing but consistent in its theming. It, it really likes to hammer home all of its major themes over and over again. And then Vladi says, this money's gonna mean something life-changing for the both of us. Like he's got big plans for that money. Put that in your pocket and remember it for a while. It's gonna be funny, good times for everyone. I feel like this whole harvesting your eggs thing, donating eggs to a fertility clinic, this shows up, but there doesn't seem to be any kind of narrative or thematic payoff for that, this metaphor doesn't carry through. Yeah, no, it's just so they can have a reference to harvesting and also coming up with a reason for uh, Jupiter to hand over her DNA to somebody. And it also brings in our alien gynecologists. 
Yeah, so Jupiter puts a bid down on the telescope for $4,000, and then she hops over to the fertility clinic. And while she's fiddling with her phone in the waiting room, she finds the photo of the little gray men. She doesn't, like, really remember where she got it from. It also turns out that the reason they were looking for a Catherine Dunleavy is because Jupiter used her friend, employer, very best friend and closest confidant, Catherine Dunleavy's name, to donate eggs. They start to sedate her, and then they do the same hover thing, where they lift her up into the air and stick something in her neck to test her, quote, gene print. Why is she still conscious when they're doing this? I just don't know. And then they say kill her and they start to turn off her oxygen. And this is all like really, really affecting and terrifying for me right up until the point where the space werewolf comes in shooting. Channing Tatum bursts in through the doors and he starts shooting doctors and bouncing off the ceiling on his hover rollerblades because they're actually aliens. He has elf ears. This is amazing. He has elf ears and his name is Kane Wise. My brother was walking through the living room at this moment and he burst out laughing. Kane Wise. Kane like in canine. Wise is in Homo sapien. They literally named him Dog Boy. Meanwhile, here's a quick shot over to an anti-gravity orgy in the middle of a space opera. Yep, this is a thing that happens. And then a girl with bad ears comes in. This character's name is Famulus and she's the best. I love her. <laughs> and she informs... Titus, who at this point, he's in a space orgy. This plus all of his other scenes later, I just start calling him Zap Brannigan in my notes. Yeah, that's about right. She informs Zap Brannigan that they found the girl. That's the whole scene. We just needed to have that anti-grav orgy in there. This movie really wanted to have an anti-grav orgy. I mean, what movie wouldn't want to have an anti-grav orgy? That was right on their dream board. They had all of their important scenes and then a little note card that said anti-grav orgy. The important thing to know about this movie is that no ideas were bad ideas for this movie. Every single idea that the Wachowskis had, they put in this movie. They just sat down and said, let's make the movie that we've always wanted to make. Let's put all the stuff we've always wanted to put into a movie in the movie. And it's amazing. <laughs> And they directed, wrote, and produced it. So nobody could say no, and we got this for good or ill. We got this. Jupiter wakes up. She's been asleep 12 hours, and Channing Tatum left her a gun. And it snarls like a dog when she turns the safety off. And here's the thing. This movie, in certain parts, is basically a masterclass in female desire. Case in point number one, the first real quote-unquote meet cute we have between the characters, the first conversation they have, Channing Tatum gives her a gun so she feels safe. He kneels to get down on her level. He speaks in a soft voice so he doesn't alarm her. And at no point does she, he treat her like she's stupid for not knowing stuff. And uh, let's also talk about the fact that he made sure she was fully clothed, which a little weird since he dressed her up while she was unconscious, but he didn't leave her in the paper dressing gown. He did not, not want to have this conversation with her while she was half naked. This is what women want. I also want to point out that Channing Tatum in this movie is not nearly as bulky as Channing Tatum in a lot of other movies, mostly action movies. By his standards, he's actually kind of lean. That would be a conscious decision. Uh, it's, it goes back again to the thing we said in our Riker solo thing, where if you get Hugh Jackman on a male magazine, he's going to be like all hulked out and like naked and sheening. And then if you get Hugh Jackman on good housekeeping, he's wearing a cardigan and smiling very warmly at you. He then just sort of cuts down and we have some lines that are, it can be difficult for Terses or people from underdeveloped worlds to hear that their planet is not the only inhabited world in the verse. They actually call it the verse. He says, I'm a genomgeneered human. My genes were spliced with something like a wolf. Holy shit. As far as I'm concerned, Channing Tatum is the best actor in the world because he was able to say all of this without bursting into laughter. How many takes must this have taken for him to do this with a straight face? genome geneered genome geneered human and once that finally comes out of his mouth he gives her the whole come with me if you want to live speech meanwhile here comes a little dragon buddy yeah we have a brief scene so that god emperor eddie redmayne can scream at a dragon and then we cut back double our security and destroy any ships that come near the planet and then he just Go! We can't actually have Annie scream like he did in the movie because that would blow out our levels. It would completely blow out the levels. I'm trying to reel this in as, as much as I can while still getting the intent across. Balem has no settings between horse whisper and shriek. 
It's either one or the other, and it's incredible. Back in Chicago, Channing Tatum is explaining his boots. Channing Tatum spends a lot of this movie explaining stuff. They use the force of gravity, redirecting it into deferential equation slopes that you can surf. And I just have in my notes, no, you stop that. What's really great is that Jupiter is also like, I heard gravity and surf. Like, even she's not paying attention to the techno babble in this movie. And then she's like, well, I don't know if I want to get into an invisible spaceship off the top of the Sears Tower. So he scoops her up into his arms, which is what he's going to be doing for a lot of this movie. Yeah, he bridal carries her up into a pillar of light because that's what kind of movie this is. They're on top of the Sears freaking tower. Okay, you know what? For the rest of this, this whole scene... First off, the rest of this scene is eight minutes long, and it is apparently the longest and most expensive action sequence that they have done. And second, I get the feeling that the fact that this movie is set in Chicago is partially a conscious decision, because I feel like they did so many glamorous, beautiful shots of the Chicago city skyline that the city of Chicago may have put a little money in the Wachowskis' pockets to be like, look, can you just set it not in New York? We have stuff here. We've got a magnificent mile. So let's just fly around the magnificent mile a while. Just a lot. You can just look at all of our buildings. We've got some of those. We've got tall buildings. We've got the Sears Tower, guys. The ship gets blown up. And then we have an eight minute action sequence. Uh, that's like an aerial chase scene. And Jupiter spends most of it falling and screaming. And uh, meanwhile, Channing Tatum dives around and fights and saves Jupiter and protects Jupiter and, and is super dreamy on his rollerblades. I like the first half of this scene in which he is trying to sort of slowly skate down in various sort of loops and finding other places to sort of skate off of to slowly get down to street level. I think that part's pretty neat and it's not something I see a lot because it's just like a guy sort of trying to gently fall down. And then the rest of it happens and it's st- and it keeps happening. Yeah, the scene is like three times longer than it needs to be. A lot of my notes for this are this is still happening. Let's just move on. We have looped around the magnificent mile in Chicago about 20 times at this point. Yeah, the whole chase sequence uh, ends with that visual gag where something lightly brushes a car and the alarm goes off. And I don't care how overused this joke is. I love it every time. <laughs> it's a very palpable relief when that happens because you realize we're finally done. As Max said, Jupiter spends a lot of this scene just sort of being an object that Channing Tatum has to worry about. And unfortunately, she spends a lot of... If there's one thing that I can really say that I don't care for in this movie is that while Jupiter has a lot of fabulous things happen to her, she doesn't make a whole lot of choices. And the ones that she does make are ones where she has no other option. There's like a a lot of the promotional pictures showed her in like this uh, skin tight black outfit being kind of a badass with a gun. But that doesn't actually really come until like the last eighth of the movie. The rest of the time, it's she's pretty and... Need saved, please help. Yeah, she's falling and screaming, and this movie should be called Jupiter Descending, but okay. Because, I mean, this is absolutely something that you do see in fan fiction, right? You've got your pretty character, you've got she's beautiful, everyone tells her how special she is, but she doesn't see it, and her eyes change color to gray when she's angry, and usually they're a brilliant violet. And a lot of times in these stories, when, when a lot of young women are first making their original characters, they just want someone to whom all of the things that they want to happen, happen is not necessarily that they want to take control of things and make cool stuff happen. Uh, Sometimes it's a generalization. But they want neat stuff to happen to them. And that's where a lot of that fan fiction sort of storytelling device will tend to manifest. Boyfriends happen to the character. They roller skate into your life and are awesome and love you unconditionally and will do anything for you. And yeah. I mean, that's how John and I met. He roller skated into my dorm room and took me to a concert. Carried you bridal style. That's how all of our dates began, in fact. So anyway, we cut to Eddie Redmayne's holodeck. Eddie Redmayne has a holodeck that he can use to get all creepy over Jupiter. He's just really close to holodeck Jupiter's face and goes, no one understands the universe like you did. No one understands me like you did. And I right next to it, I just have, oh my God. Yeah, it about to get real Oedipal up ins. The Oedipus complex is in this movie and there are multiple ones. They are so beautifully intricate and twisted that they're actually kind of art. It's fully explored. We get the Oedipal complex from all angles. Meanwhile, 
they stole a car. And Jupiter's like, I can't believe we stole a car. And Kane's like, this is an action movie. Deal with it. And he explains, like, they're going to neuralize the whole city so nobody can remember. And they're after you. The Abrasix family is after you, Jupiter. And she says, but I'm nobody. And he's like, Jupiter, you don't understand how special you are. You're so special. And then Jupiter notices that Kane is bleeding because I guess he got shot at some point during that eight minute action sequence that we didn't notice. And she rummages around in the glove box and pulls out a menstrual pad. And you'd think this would be really clever but then she takes the adhesive side and sticks that to the wound. That's not the absorbent part. Nope. <laughs> to his credit, Channing Tatum is just kind of like briefly baffled, but he isn't like super grossed out by it like a lot of dudes would be. <laughs> yeah, usually it'd be like, oh, what is that? Does that go on your, oh no. But instead he's just kind of, oh, okay, I guess that works. And then he keeps driving. <laughs> Shouldn't it go the other way? I don't know. You need you need to flip it around, honey. No? Okay. And now bees. So it turns out that Channing Tatum is taking Jupiter to one of his friends, the Stinger Apini, and they pull up and it's like surrounded by flowers. There are bees everywhere. It's a marshal for the Aegis, and it turns out his name is Stinger. Because bees! Get it? Stinger a peeny because bees! He has bee stripes in his hair. He has little glowing yellow hexagons in his eyes sometimes. And he's played by Sean Bean. Or should we say Sean B? <laughs> bee! I couldn't bear to keep writing Stinger, so I just called him Mr. B for the rest of the movie in my notes. So Channing Tatum and Mr. B have a weird slow-mo fist fight. Yeah, they fight because men. And then out comes a girl named Kiza, who is Stinger's daughter. There's not a Mrs. B, as far as we can tell. No, it's just Mr. B and his daughter. And then Jupiter gets swarmed by bees and they all love her. And she can control them. She like waves her hand around and they move. And they're like, oh, this means you're royalty. She's the bee whisperer. It's a, it's a very beautiful shot. I like it a lot. Yeah, it's it's unironically pretty and also hilarious because bees can sense royalty. Bees are genetically designed to recognize royalty, Stinger tells us later. That's an actual line in this movie. He tells her that and then he's like, bees aren't like humans. They don't question or doubt. Bees don't lie. And the best thing about this entire sequence is that Sean Bean is so completely sincere and earnest about delivering these lines and it's incredible. This is a man who has written so much poetry about bees. Meanwhile, Kiza says, I'm going to go to town to get food. She has like three lines and she coughs and then that's her entire part in the movie. She disappears from the movie and is never seen again and is mentioned once. She's just gone. And then Channing Tatum takes off his shirt and he doesn't put it back on again for a solid 30 minutes of screen time because this movie loves you and wants you to be happy. He has hot, sexy man pain scars on his back because he used to have wings. That's right. The space werewolf used to be a winged space werewolf. The best bioneural synaptic prosthetic the military could buy because this movie won't stop throwing stupid, stupid, stupid. Stupid combinations of words at you. I love this. This is 100% fanfic. Not only is he an, an angsty, tortured space werewolf, he's an angsty, tortured space werewolf who used to have angel wings. He's a fallen angel werewolf. I love this. And then Jupiter realizes that it's been a very long time since she talked to somebody normal. So she's like, I gotta go call my cousin real quick. While she heads off, Mr. B and Channing Tatum have a conversation about wings and other stuff that's too silly to believe. And it ends with the line, if she is a recurrence, then this is a hell of a lot more important than wings. Actual line in this movie. Oh my god. Meanwhile, it turns out that Cousin Vladdy's big plans for his $10,000 were a big-ass TV, an Xbox, and a Roomba. I don't think that cost him $10,000. Now, I'm pretty sure you can get all of that for under 5 k And he bought all this stuff without actually getting any money. He panics over the fact that the uh, egg harvesting did not actually happen. And then Jupiter hangs up on him, and he has, like, a little panic attack. And then his little, I think it's his younger sibling, is like, you're in trouble. And he's like, you're in trouble. And it's kind of great. Remember when regular things happened? You need a breather from this is a lot more important than wings and bees are genetically designed to sense royalty. Let's talk about Xbox. Anyway, uh, Stinger, Mr. B, is using an old uh, Star Wars prop to contact the space cops. There's a blockade around Earth, but Aegis Command says once her gene print is verified, they'll get an injunction to take us to Aorus. Those are words that make sense. And then he gives uh, he gives Channing Tatum the key to the gun shed. Channing Tatum walks off and then we get like the best bit of character exposition ever. Oh my God. I had to sit down and write down this whole 
fucking thing. Because Jupiter is like, you know, Channing Tatum seems different since we got here. And it's like, you've known Channing Tatum for about two hours. And I'm like, oh no, he's tortured. And this is fascinating because I love Monster Boyfriends. By all accounts, this ought to check off all my boxes, but somehow it doesn't. And I don't know why. So Mr. B sits down and says... He's a lichen tant without a pack. He had the bad luck to be born half albino, runt of the litter. Half albino means Channing Tatum is blonde and wears eyeliner, by the way. The splicer that bred him had to sell him to the Legion for a loss. But a lichen tant needs a pack. It's their center of gravity. Alone, usually, they waste away and die. Unless they become like him. Fearless, relentless, perfect hunting machines. And then it turns out Channing Taven got court-martialed because he bit an entitled, whatever that is, tore his throat out. There's something about the royals for Kane. It's instinctual. And apparently this did not come up at all before he, like, physically attacked one of them. Uh, this is supposed to be, like, add an extra edge to his character. Like, ooh, he's a little dangerous. But there's, he is never actually a threat to her at all. It's a little Twilighty, honestly. The only time this whole, like, like intent without a pack thing ever comes up is when Mr. B is talking about it. I feel like that's supposed to be a subtext thread that comes up throughout all of Channing Tatum's interactions with Jupiter Jones, but it's not. Maybe Mr. B is just reading into things. And then Jupiter is like, hey, can you give me a huge info dump on the entire history of the universe? Mr. B is like, yeah, sure. Here we go. Sit back and listen. You've been taught that the birthplace of humanity is Earth, but it's not. It's actually a planet in the Cannabulum system called Oros. A little over a billion of your years ago, and then I couldn't write this part down because it was dumb, but there was a species on Earth called the Sauron. And then they engineered a mass extinction event. That's right. Apparently humans wiped out the dinosaurs to seed Earth with life, but the planet was seeded 100,000 years ago, but the dinosaurs died 65 million years ago, and it doesn't really match up. But we don't have time to argue about this. Because, quote unquote, they're here. Uh, also, they harvest planets when they get too overpopulated, so, you know. So bounty hunters approach the house, along with a lot of little gray men. It's another pointlessly long action scene. The rave chick and the very, very black guy attack the guy with the monocle, and then they, they turn on them and take Jupiter away somewhere else in their ship. And shirtless Channing Tatum can't save her. But he does manage to latch onto the ship and climb on board. And when they leave... The ship leaves some stupid freaking crop circles. Are you for real? Yep, crop circles. Yeah, for like five minutes, this movie turns into signs. Also, uh, important thing to take away from this action scene. Sean Bean says beeswax as an expletive in this movie. Yeah, he does. As we travel through space, I also want to point out that the costume design is gorgeous. And I honestly really love the spaceship designs. I love how they move. I love how they hold together. They have like little fans on them. It's pretty neat. We take a quick sidebar over on Jupiter the planet that is not ascending because Belem wants to harvest Earth early. He wants to do it tomorrow. Because he doesn't want to let, quote, her have it. I think he's speaking more metaphorically. He says he'll harvest it tomorrow before he lets her have it. And uh, the bounty hunters deliver Jupiter as someone who is definitely not Balem. Uh, they land on the fall planet where we last saw Kalik. And then Jupiter wakes up in a beautiful dress and an anti-grav bed with a fancy room with the servant. AI. This is just so full on like wish fulfillment fanfic in here. And also she's in the prettiest house in the entire universe. And here comes Kalik with a huge retinue of fabulously dressed women. That's how I want to live my life. Just go from room to room with a retinue of fabulously dressed women following me everywhere. It's not the worst way to live. No. Let's go to the fancy candle statue room. Which is definitely a fire hazard with all these trailing skirts. In our world. Genes have an almost spiritual significance. They are the seeds of our immortality. When the exact same genes reappear in the exact same order, it is for us what you would call reincarnation. There's a statue of Jupiter in the room. Yep, Jupiter is apparently her mommy. It was your mommy. Jupiter is a reincarnation, sort of, of Kalik Balem and Zap Brannigan's mommy. It also means Jupiter gets all of her stuff. We find that out later. And also... It turns out that Kalik is part of why humans have vampire stories somehow. I've noticed the Wachowskis do like to sneak references like this in, like in, in uh, The Matrix Reloaded. It was implied that legends like vampires and werewolves were just these rogue programs within The Matrix. They'll just throw in these offhand references that never tie back into anything. It's basically Kalik turning directly into the camera and saying, yes, I'm basically Elizabeth Bathory. It's fine. 
And then she says, all right, I'm 14,000 years old. My mom was murdered. I want to be buddies. And then we keep getting this thing where, like, we keep switching between Channing Tatum sneaking around on his stupid rollerblades that glow while Kalik has a dip in the gack. She has a Franken bath, which the machines are manned by a blowfish? He's got spikes on his face. Anyway. So Kalik goes into the bath and she comes out and it's Tuppence Middleton without any old lady makeup on her. And she's like, feel my skin. And it's not weird at all. No. Then we switch back to Channing Tatum and his rollerblades as he fights some guys. And then back to Jupiter where Kalik exposits at her some more. And she's like, you could own the earth once you claim your title as my mommy. And then meanwhile, Kane comes rollerblading into the rescue. Yeah, he just sort of shows up. He's like, the Aegis is on its way. Channing Tatum called the space cops. And then Kalik says, well, that was it for me in this movie. Have fun, guys. G-L-H-F. G-G. Let's go to the bureaucracy planet. Yeah, and the space cops come and they pick Jupiter up and they make Kane put on a shirt. And also Mr. B is here. This whole crew, in, in the glimpses that we see, they're like, there's a ragtag group of different aliens and robots. And it seems like there should be something interesting in this crew going on here. Like they should have like a like a dynamic here where they're all just sort of snarky at each other, but they all love each other. And it feels like this movie should have been about them, but it isn't. Also, I want to point out that one of the guys on the bridge here named Pilo Percadium is played by Ramon Tikaram, a.k.a. Dorian Pavis from Dragon. Dragon Age Inquisition. Really? Yep. <laughs> if you heard his voice, and you're like, I know that voice from somewhere. That's where. See, the only one that sticks out to me besides Robot is the Elephant Man pilot we see later. Nesh. Nesh the Elephant Man pilot, who is amazing. I love him. I'm pretty sure his name is Hooter. And as soon as she gets on the boat, Jupiter asks for clothes that she can change into by herself while she's conscious. And Channing Tatum has no idea what she means when she gives him a pointed glance. Also, let's get back to Jupiter, where Mr. Scales is getting the shaft. Balem tortures a dragon to death and then replaces him with a completely identical dragon, so what was the point of that? This one's got a fancy leather jacket. And again, Balem just sort of drapes himself on loungewear. You are the dragon in a fancy leather jacket. Why don't you go advance the plot? By which he means abduct the family. Yeah, you know, we'll get to that. Meanwhile, Jupiter is changed into some, like, nice, actually comfortable, durable-looking clothes that I would like to wear and look nice in. She's ready for another scene with Channing Tatum, where she's desperately in love with him for some reason. The thirst is real. I was talking about earlier about how Jupiter, I feel, is a very passive protagonist. The only point in which she is not is in how much she pursues and is thirsty for Channing Tatum. She just goes after him repeatedly. Holy crap. Yeah, to the point where it gets a little, like, sexual harassment-y. And Channing Tatum shows up at her quarters, gives her some pills, and says, you might want to take these. Portaling can be a little rough on the royal bowels. That's verbatim. That's in the movie. Don't be barfy. You're so special. And then they have, like, a really long, awkward conversation about genetic defects. It's a defect of my genome engineering. Kane talks about how he's, he's got a defect that makes him bite royals, I guess. You know, that thing that we that we never see. And then she puts the moves on him, and he says no, because he's a space werewolf. And she's a space princess. We are too different. I have more in common with a dog than I have with you. And Jupiter looks him right in the eye and says, I love dogs. I've always loved dogs. Neither of them can believe that line actually happened. There's a shot of each of them where they're both like, uh. Like she even repeats it to herself after he leaves. I've always loved dogs. Anyway, it's time for Bureaucracy Planet. Bureaucracy Planet! I can't tell if this is my favorite or least favorite part of this movie. I can't tell. Basically, it's Jupiter trying to get her paperwork through, but to get her paperwork through, she has to get other paperwork through. And to do this, she has to get other paperwork through. And to do this, she has to get other paperwork through. And also, she needs this other paperwork that came first that she can't get without this paperwork. And so it's just like a catch-22. So by the way, how about we bribe you? Yeah, it's an entire Terry Gillum bureaucracy democracy scene. It's kind of incredible. <laughs> they get met at the uh, at the door by intergalactic advocate Bob, who is a, a robot with makeup. He's got a little worry thing on the side of his face that whirs when he gets upset. He has a special compartment in his wrist, a built-in wrist launcher for bribe money. It's incredible. I didn't even think about that, but you're right. That is absolutely what that compartment was for. So they finally get Jupiter's special tattoo that identifies her as a queen. And then Channing Tatum is like, look at my pointy ears, your majesty. You're your life is about to change. And she's like, I like it when you call me your majesty, but only you. 
She likes it a little too much. She's like, I'm still the same me. Do you want to bite me? Yeah, you should bite me. And you would just, you would hear the keyboard tanking furiously, delving into the emotional struggle of his like third person limited perspective. That is his true love for her and how he would like to bite her, but in a sexy way, but he can't because they are so different and he's so tortured. And then he's like, no, I don't want to bite you, but I do want to bite you. And then whoopsie, double crossed by Mr. B. And he's sending them off to the Rococo Death Star. Time to meet Zap Brannigan. <laughs> in like a very, very expensive t-shirt and jeans that he definitely bought from like Nordstrom's. Those are leather pants. Those are actual literal leather pants. Oh man. And he's got like a little V-neck on his tight t-shirt. And turns out Jupiter's had some time to read. Yep, because she kicks Titus's ass with regulations and demands that he take her back to Earth. He's like, all right, sure. But in the meantime, why don't we have some sex and dinner and sex and wait, did I say the sex part out loud? Remember what we said about Oedipus complexes? Yeah. Meanwhile, Channing Tatum is being locked up in a little tube. Famulus taunts Kane with the idea that uh, Titus is going to bang his not mom, I guess. Because the whole rest of the narrative knows that those two are desperately in love with each other. This is another fanfic thing where every single character thinks that the main OTP is desperate desperately in love with each other, but the two of them are completely oblivious. They just don't even realize how much they need each other. Meanwhile, Jupiter shows up to dinner with Titus in a dress that Titus just had, I guess. It's a very sexy dinner with a very sexy, beautiful dress. Titus was apparently very close to his mom. Yeah. And while we let that sink in, we switch back to the Channing Tatum tube. Did you know that at no point did they say, while we are imprisoning Channing Tatum, maybe we should take his gravity boots? Because funny story, nobody took his gravity boots. Anyway, at the sexy dinner where everything is ravishing. Zap Brannigan's like, you're in love with Channing Tatum. And he's like, but have you considered? I'm not like other boys, TM. Let me show you my tiny tube room. This is not the tiny tube room with Channing Tatum in it. These are even tinier tubes. <laughs> They're teeny tiny tubes. Yep, because it turns out that youth juices people. Zap Brannigan goes on and on about how at the end of her life, his mother was turning against this cruel industry of youth via people. And then she was murdered for it. And he's trying to continue her work, but he's about to be murdered too. And he needs to make sure that it, all the planets he owns goes to somebody who won't harvest them. So he pulls out the most ridiculous engagement ring in the entire world and says, Jupiter Jones, will you marry me? It's like six inches long. We also keep like spinning the camera around in every single shot in this scene, which like kind of bugs me until we settle right on that giant gaudy piece of garbage that is an engagement ring, which is something that apparently we still have in space. I'm just reveling in Jupiter Jones, will you marry me? Like I said, the Oedipus complexes in this movie are just beautiful. They're incredible. Meanwhile, in the Tatum tube, he is very sad. And then we switch back to the Seder girl, where she's on the phone with Mr. B. And they have talks about how they're gonna chuck Channing Tatum into space. That's a hard sentence to say. Bits of implicating dialogue about how Stinger got paid, etc, etc. And then the call cuts out and the space cops are tracking the call. And then they put Mr. B back in the brig, be mostly because his betrayal made absolutely no sense, lasted about five seconds, wasn't telegraphed at all, and it was only only basically there to get them over to Zap Brannigan's sexy ship. A lot of stuff happens in this movie just because it has to. Just to get them to the next chapter in the fanfic. So then Zap Brannigan goes back to the Tatum tube and takes him out of the tube to reveal his evil sexy plan. Lies, lies are a necessity. They're the source of meaning, of belief, and hope. Honestly, lies are sometimes the only reason I get out of bed. This is all whispered very seductively to Channing Tatum. And then they take him into an airlock. Yeah, and he's gonna murder Jupiter after they're married so that he gets the Earth because reasons. By the way, all these little robot soldiers that he has, they don't even have like joints in their arms. They're just little stubbly guns coming out of shoulder sockets. They're like trap draw from He-Man. I love them. And then Channing Tatum gets spaced. And nobody took his stupid boots. And nobody got rid of those little capsules. Yeah, these emergency spacesuit capsules that are apparently in the door. Because he just grabs one and makes a little spacesuit with like 40 minutes of oxygen. And then the ship goes into a warp. So I guess it still kind of works that he's just going to float out in space until he dies in 40 minutes. But why would you even put that there? Just standard issue in an airlock. They didn't bother to strip it out before they decided to space a werewolf. Meanwhile... Back on Earth? Vladi gets yelled at for treating his cousin like a chicken. I love this scene. Your cousin is not a chicken. Because he explains like we're going to sell her eggs. And they're like, what? And then he also explains about the telescope. 
And Jupiter's aunt is like, this family is cursed. I wish we'd seen more of Jupiter's aunt, honestly. She's fun. Right? There are more lines where Jupiter mentions her aunt than the aunt actually has, like, actual lines and dedicated screen time. Anyway, then a dragon shows up. Yeah, a tractor beam shows up in their living room, and then a bunch of dragonborn just sort of pile in. They're like, we gon' get you. And that's the end of that scene. Meanwhile, back in space, Channing Tatum is out of oxygen. Could this be the end of Channing Tatum? Of course not. As he starts dying, he flashes back to all the beloved moments that he had with Jupiter Jones. All the three scenes where Jupiter has done stuff and he has been in the room with her. Thankfully, they are they are not auditory flashbacks, so we don't get I love dogs. I would have loved to get I love dogs again. <laughs> and then the uh, the Aegis ship like, shows up in the background as he's dying and they resuscitate him and then he fills him in on Zach. Brannigan's plan. And then we go back to the sexy ship. And Jupiter's like, um, no thanks. I would rather not get married. And then Titus is like, well, okay, that's fine. Also, I've got these pardons for Mr. B and Channing Tatum so they could be skyjackers again. You know, you don't have to marry me. That's fine. This is fine. I could have used this against you, but I'm not going to. It's fine. And then Jupiter's like, fine, I'll marry you. Jesus Christ. Oh my God. He's like, oh, by the way, Channing Tatum attacked people. So I gave him to the police. And then he's actually like, oh, you love him. It's beauty and her beast. Like little on the nose, Zap. Also, do you even have that myth? Humans had to get it from somewhere. I guess Earth humans. And we're going to see this scene again later in the movie where there's a Jupiter is like, wait, I'll do it. Back on the Aegis ship, Channing Tatum wants Mr. B to help him. And it's actually kind of cute because uh, Mr. B is like, well, I did it to save my daughter. She's sick. You you know that one cough she had? Yeah, that's apparently life-threatening and I didn't have the money to fix it. And then it's kind of funny how Channing Tatum's just like, okay... Uh, you got any other sick relatives I could worry about? No. Uh, any other obligations? No. Any debts? No. Okay, he's good. Come on. (laughs) Like, this is actually really clever and funny, and I like it. No, I like it. I like it. And I like how you put it in regular language with Keys is sick. But here's the actual line. Keys has got the bug. I couldn't afford the recode. Bug is capital B, by the way. We now have a scene that is two scenes. It's a wedding scene and then an action scene. We have this incredible action scene where uh, Stinger and Kane are like flying in on, in these mech suits to try and get through this armada of defense spots to get to the ship. And meanwhile, it's intercut with Jupiter's about to marry a guy. And it's, it's intercut like these things are both equally dramatic and I kind of love it. Can we just talk about how much I love the costumes in this wedding scene? It's great. Straight up, there's this shot where, where, and they use this a lot in the trailers, where Jupiter comes out on this little hollow platform in this beautiful, like, white cherry tree dress. With branches in her hair. Yeah, and she gets just hovered over this crowd of people, all dressed in white, down to where the actual ceremony is. And it is real pretty. Also, this entire audience are quote-unquote sims, which I guess means they're just robots, and they're just there because you need to have a huge crowd at a royal wedding. It's law. Yeah, that is actually what he says. Also, the ceremony, it tattoos a hollow wedding band tattoo on your left ring finger. That is so science fiction, so dumb as heck. So in line with, like... Eurocentric marriage traditions. I'm so into this. It's got so many layers of ridiculousness that it's actually kind of beautiful, which I guess describes this movie as well. Oh yeah. Their vows are also written more like an actual contract, being like, I am of sound mind and body and I do this of my own volition, but it's still at a wedding? They're not like doing this as like just a little go down to the courthouse and sign some paperwork. This is a freaking wedding. The whole vow, the whole ceremony is, I name am entering in this union to become the spouse of name. I do this of my own free will. I am of sound mind and body. And then you put your hand on a little thing and get a tat. And that's it. I love it. Frankly, the giant space fight, it can fuck off. I'm just here for this dumbass space wedding. And then Channing Tatum crashes his mech suit into the side of the chapel. And then I love the space fight. His ship just crashes into the room and he rollerblades out, lands right at the ceremony and points a gun at Zap Brannigan and says, you were gonna kill her. And and Jupiter like believes him instantly. It's amazing. And also Masterclass in Female Desire Part 2, Channing Tatum with a gun drawn on this guy who was going to uh, take advantage of Jupiter and then murder her 
says, may I kill him? I could write an entire essay about that one line, may I kill him? The whole damage and everything that is being done here is to Jupiter, and therefore it's not really Channing Tatum is mad on her behalf, but it is Jupiter who is the injured party and therefore should decide what this man deserves. And also, like, it has this whole loyal monster boyfriend attack dog thing going on that's incredible. Ah, there's, ah. Women want monster boyfriends. Women want very polite monster boyfriends. Or very polite monster girlfriends, or, you know, we just want very polite monsters. So Jupiter's like, let's just go home. I remember seeing this in the airplane. I'm like, well, that's that's the end of that plot. Like, are we are we done yet? That seemed like that was a climactic battle. What do you mean it's not even halfway through yet? This movie is all over the place in terms of pacing. It really is a multi-chapter fanfic more than a three-act movie. Oh, yeah. Because at this point, Zat Branning is like, just like his sister, he's like, well, I guess that was my part in the movie. Goodbye forever. I'll never contact you again. None of this will come back in the finale. Allie, don't worry about it. I'm gone. Goodbye. And then Jupiter has a sad. Because nothing can go right and she just gets hurt. The more you care, the more the world finds ways to hurt you. I don't think that this scene is consistent with what actually happened. No, Jupiter is like, I was gonna be murdered after I got married to somebody I didn't even like, who was also sort of like a son. My son? I was gonna get married to him for contractual reasons, and then he was gonna kill me, and I've known him for like an hour? Yeah, I feel like the scene would have worked better if it had been cast as she's just really overwhelmed by everything and not feeling mopey and betrayed. Yeah, because mopey and betrayed is definitely what you get here. But she still wants to just go home. She wants to go home and she tosses Channing Tatum his pardon, which she still has. Where was she holding that? She just had it, I guess. That dress had room for pockets, right? You know, it's a beautiful, brilliant space dress. I believe that in the space future, we will find a way to have gorgeous gowns that also have deep, deep pockets. And so Jupiter gets back home and Belem's little, like, mouse toady is here waiting. How long has he been there? We just don't know. How long has he been expected to wait there for her to show up? Can you imagine that conversation with Balem? You want me to do what? Wait there very, very dramatically. And then when she comes in, she'll be like, where is everyone? And then you'll be like, I'm here. And she'll be like, oh no, it will be very cool. And there's also a dragon in the shadows who calls Cain Dingo and earns my eternal love and admiration. And he's like, all right, come with me, abdicate, and your family probably won't be killed. And Jupiter's like, wait, I'll do it. It's a very obvious trap. She's going in without any backup, except the Aegis ship can, like, follow them. And then we're, we're done. I guess this is going to be the third act now? <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a three-act movie. That's not what this is. That was a short chapter, and now we're on to uh, the, the I'd call this about, what, three chapters? Maybe four, five? The three-part finale chapter. Right, where there's a whole lot of content, and it probably could have been broken up into smaller chunks anyway, but who cares? Here we go. So the space cop ship is following them to the refinery, but Balem's ship closes the gate behind them, and the hurricane comes down, and it's all very dramatic as they have to pilot this ship out of the hurricane. And the elephant man has some toots. Yeah, the elephant man toots in distress as he's trying to pilot this ship and it's incredible. Hooter. And now God Emperor Titty Cape. This freaking costume is incredible. He's draped himself elegantly over a chair. A hovering couch. It's a hover couch. <laughs> this movie. And also Jupiter's here to meet him and you know what? All right, I've gotten to the point. This has been really bothering me this whole time. He's our bad guy and they have never met at all at any point. She has been dealing with like mini bosses and now here comes this guy. Who she's never met. She has no context for him aside from also related to these other Whisper siblings. It's a little like the fifth element in that our bad guy never even meets our main characters. But like, I have so many problems with this. This stupid fanfic. It's the best thing ever. Anyway. My mother taught me what was necessary to rule this universe. Like killing people and their speed of silence. I create life! Eddie Redmayne, what are you doing? How much of this do you think was just him doing whatever the hell he wanted? Yeah, how much of this was in the script and how much of this was, let's just wind him up and watch him go. And then, uh, then he's like, my mom was really special and she taught me that some lives will always matter more than others. Like you, Jupiter, Jupiter, you're so special. You're so special, Jupiter. You don't even realize how special you are. And then we get another moment where Jupiter's like, is that why you killed your mom? And he just straight up slaps her and like, there's another beat of silence and then 
How dare you! Meanwhile, Channing Tatum is having a big old brood. He's glaring down at a hurricane like it's personally offended him, and it probably has. And Mr. B comes along and gives him a pep talk that basically boils down to go get your girl, bro. You lied in the Commonwealth because you're a hunter who's been searching for one thing his whole life. You survived so long without it that the fact that you may have found it terrifies you. But not as much as the fact that she's down there, buried in several tons of hurricane. And if you want to see her again, then you take my advice. You get down there and you start digging. I kind of love the whole, aw, Jupiter's his pack, you guys, thing, but I feel like this movie doesn't emphasize it nearly enough. I feel like it doesn't really play into it at all. I would have liked to see more of this, like, instinctual monster boyfriend. Also, the subtitles here for Channing Tatum in this shot is, uh, breathes ferociously. Normally, I don't understand the appeal of Channing Tatum. In this movie, I kind of get it. All right, folks, it's time. Gather around for the story beat so nice. They did it twice. Yep, we have Channing Tatum in a mech suit flying someplace and fighting his way in intercut with, oh no, Jupiter's about to sign some documents. We do this whole thing twice. I love this stupid movie. It is such, like, my first most serious fanfic that I take so seriously, you guys. This is the best movie ever made. This is a fan fiction that unironically uses the word smexy. So, back on Jupiter the planet, where Jupiter the girl has been handed the abdication paperwork. And I just sort of pat around for a couple of seconds and then he's like, Look, the floor is see-through. There's your family. They're in tubes. They're going to die unless you sign this stuff. Sign the thing. And she's like, I'll do anything so long as my family's safe. And he's like, you can't bargain. But that was the, that was the, that's what you just said. That was your position. It's baffling. This scene, again, is like way too long because we got a pad for time while Channing Tatum flies through a hurricane. And as Channing Tatum descends into the hurricane, the Aegis ship is like, Channing Tatum, you're so special and brave and also tortured. You are desperately in love with our main character. You're the best. Also, officially, I have to reprimand you for doing this because this is dumb. But also, Channing Tatum, you're the best. Channing Tatum proceeds to break the entire refinery. With his love. And also his mech suit. He punches a hole through the shield and the gas starts coming in and reacting with stuff. Are you ready for the rest of this movie, except for the very last scene, to be entirely in orange and blue? And then Jupiter's like, wait a minute, you're just going to kill everybody on Earth anyway, so I'm not going to sign this abdication paperwork, so you can't kill the rest of the Earth. Yay, Jupiter makes a selfless decision. Yeah, that's right. Jupiter's greatest triumph is not doing anything. In action. Anyway, here comes the toady. It turns out Channing Tatum messed up the entirety of Jupiter. And then Channing Tatum bursts into the room below them and shoots up a bunch of dragon men. Balem goes to strangle Jupiter and then she just knees him in the groin. It's maybe the best thing. It, he lets out this shriek when it happens too. It, it's very much like a no one makes me bleed my own blood sort of thing. And then Jupiter drops through the floor and uh, takes a moment to make out with a space werewolf right before she saves her family. She gets a gun. They make out a little and then they're like, yeah. And then we make out some more. And now we're leaving to go before the whole thing blows up. Channing Tatum distracts all the dragons while Jupiter gets her family out, only then she's attacked by Titty Cape. And it's great because he hits her with a thing that slashes her arm open. She pulls a gun on him and he's like, you won't shoot, you're just like her. And she shoots him in the leg and it's incredible. It's like, you won't pull that trigger, bang! Now, while Channing Tatum fights that, like, dragonborn in the little leather jacket, Jupiter finds her way into a maintenance tube and has to try and find her way out of it. Yeah, the, like, the floor opens up and they both fall in and there's more Jupiter falling and screaming for an inordinately long amount of time. And then they land, end up on opposite sides of the garbage tube and Jupiter runs off into the maintenance tube. And meanwhile, this is a movie where a space werewolf is in a fist fight with a dragon, and I love it. It happens for a really long time. Just Channing Tatum punches a dragon. A lot. Like a whole lot. It is a really long punching scene. I feel like this movie would have been significantly shorter if they just restrained themselves a little in the action scenes. Anyway, Jupiter uh, has a platforming level of a video game while she has to jump from the scaffolding as it escapes. It's basically one of those cut scenes in like Tomb Raider or, or Uncharted. She's pressing triangle at all of the right times. And it's also inordinately long. It's really long. And then finally Balem shows up and hits her with a pipe and goes all mummy's boy on her. And he's like, mommy said, I hate my life and then begged me to kill her. 
And it's like, oh no, it ties back to where Jupiter said, I hate my life. And is this supposed to be like a, like a thematic thing? Is this supposed to be, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this information because I don't feel like it's really tied together at all. Finally, Jupiter gets the pipe and smacks the crap out of Balem and says, I'm not your damn mother. And as like badass sign-offs go, it's a weird one, but it kind of works. Very Oedipal in here. Anyway, Jupiter and Balem both fall because the whole building shakes. And Jupiter survives because she has a space werewolf boyfriend and Balem doesn't. And then he puts them both in those space suits from earlier. The Aegis ship is there and they've got Jupiter's family on board and they've got to reach the ship before they take off. But the ship is like, we've got to pull out now, otherwise we're all going to die. And there's this scene where they are desperately roller skating into the ship. And it's goofy, but I also kind of unironically love it with like the operatic music and the refinery collapsing around them and blowing up and dodging debris and everything like that. It's all very orange. And then finally, they make it through and there's this little tense moment where the Aegis ship is like, oh my god, we we went without them, but I'm still getting readings on Channing Tatum. And then he's like, hey, we're floating out here. How's it going, guys? And then... Finally, it's time for the denouement. Everything's the same, but it's different. The alarm goes off at 4.45 a.m., but Jupiter's already up, and she cleaned toilets really fast, and also she has, like, earrings now. And every time she is cleaning a toilet, she pulls the glove away from her wrist and sees the thing that says that she owns the Earth, and is the secret queen of Earth. Jupiter's uncle-cousin guy apologizes for being a sexist dickbag. They got her a present, though. They all pitched in for a telescope. Jupiter's mom, who apparently has turned really bitter throughout everything that we've heard about her ever since the love of her life got shot randomly, says, I love your father very much and he was a good man. Does she actually remember being abducted by dragons or is this out of nowhere? I have no idea. I don't think they remember it. They do have those memory erasers that they used on all of Chicago, after all. They're like, hey, let's take the telescope up to the roof. And Jupiter's like, uh, I've got a date. He's a wolf angel man. Let's go to the date, which is on top of the Sears Tower. Where they're talking about how Jupiter knows now that she's the secret queen of Earth. And she's not quite sure what that means. But it means her life is different now. And also the Earth has a different future than what was planned for. And then the important thing happens, which is that Channing Tatum takes off his big long leather coat. And he's got huge, beautiful bio angel wings. We have been promised a werewolf with wings for this entire freaking movie and we only get into the last 30 seconds and I'm mad because I wanted to see him fly to her rescue in like the in the refinery scene. That would have been great. Instead here they are right now and the only thing that we really get to see them do is encircle her as they hug and make out a little and then they flare back while they're kissing like a girl kicking her leg up and then she and her boyfriend go flying because he doesn't need his hover boots anymore. He has wings. So she's got the hover boots. Two hours of my life. Two hours of- I feel like I have a hangover. This is the best movie ever made. Honestly, though, as much as we've made fun of this movie, there's really nothing else like it. There's no other movie like it. And that's why I think it deserves to be in the cinematic canon. It also very clearly resonated with people. It made something that people recognize in themselves. And just because that audience is women who wrote a whole lot of fan fiction, or at least interacted with what is considered traditionally nerdy media in a way that that is surprisingly and uniquely feminine, especially considering the rise of fan fictions and fanzines in uh, in the early days of Star Trek is something that has always been uniquely feminine in its execution. It spoke to a lot of those women because it sees the world the same way they do. We don't look upon this movie because it's like a masterpiece piece of storytelling. We look upon it because it reminds us of the kind of joyful, unself-aware, beautiful pieces of garbage that we wrote, that we put out into the world that we created for ourselves when we were teenagers and 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 tweens and like you can actually see this reflected in almost all of the reviews about it like it, it, it's panned on rotten tomatoes and imdb but if you look at the reviews all of them kind of say the same thing and it's it's a hot mess but damn it's fun not only that but the reaction is sort of split along gender lines male critics had no idea what to do with this movie they didn't realize that it wasn't for them yeah it's like the male critics are all just like this is a hot mess i don't get why people are actually liking it and the female critics are universally are like it's so terrible you have to see it. It's great. I feel like at the end of the day, the, the closest thing that you can compare this movie to is The Fifth Element, but they're very different sorts. They're both sort of wildly joyful science fiction that doesn't take itself ridiculously seriously. But at the end of the day, 
they sort of approach it from different aspects and appeal to different parts of the sort of dumb science fiction B-movie, where Jupiter Ascending, I feel, takes itself a little more seriously than The Fifth Element, but in a way that comes right back around and is almost self-aware, looks at you in the camera and says, you know how seriously you took this. You know how important all of those garbage sagas were for your original characters and all of your Mary Sues. You know what we're doing here. And that audience says, yes, yes, we do. It's not a good movie, but it is a great one. It's kind of a bad movie. The screenplay is awful. The pacing is ridiculous. The directing is, I mean, it does, it does exactly what the movie is. And whether or not you believe that the bare bones of that is, is a good thing or not is, is entirely up to you. The costume design is incredible. This movie was made lovingly. It was made by someone who was not doing this for a paycheck. They did it because they really wanted this thing to exist. So it's it's kind of a toward relationship, right? When we say this movie is dumb and kind of garbage, we say that, and in the same breath, we say that it is spectacular, and I don't think those two are mutually exclusive. It is a spectacle. It is definitely that. There seems to be a uh, cultural conception, especially these days, that just because we like something, it has to be good. Just because we hate something, it has to be bad. And really, something can be bad, and you can still like it. And something can be technically good, and you can still hate it. I hate most of the stuff that shows up at the Oscars every year. I love this movie. <laughs> And I don't think it's because the Oscar stuff is bad and this is good. It's because the Oscar stuff doesn't talk to me in my own language, and this does. This is a movie that it can make you feel a little bored at times, but there is always something entertaining to look at, whether it makes you angry or happy or confused. It makes you feel something. The worst thing a movie can ever do is make you feel bored, especially for a very long section. Even with, like, these dumb space fights, it's intercut with this ridiculous wedding. This this is Jupiter Ascending, and well, look, while I was writing a whole little essay below my notes about how I felt about this movie, the credits kept going and a subtitle popped up and said, music continues. At the end of the day, this is absolutely the movie that the Wachowskis wanted to make, and they made it, and they gave it to us. And it's better than the Matrix sequels. Mac, do you have a final fact for us? Yeah, my final fact's gonna be, if more people wrote things about alien gynecologist and dog angel men, the world would be a better place. Kit, what's your final fact? My fact is everybody loves monster spouses. And mine is, if you make the movie that you want to make, you're gonna find somebody who will appreciate it. Even if it's a giant piece of science fiction garbage. Because at least it's their giant piece of science fiction garbage. Join us next time when our next Stone Cold Fact will be Star Trek IV Save the Whales is the best Star Trek movie ever made. Kid has a lot of opinions about this one. I'm excited to hear them. Uh, we come out just about every six weeks. You can find us just about wherever podcasts are found, except SoundCloud. If you want to hear us every single week, we are over at the Gem Jam. I'm imagining most of you probably listen to us from that, but in case you don't, we talk about Gem and the Holograms every week. And that can be found wherever podcasts are sold or found. Probably don't pay for us. We are also on Patreon. That is on patreon.com slash the Gem Jam. I will fight you as a podcast that is brought to you and brought to us, I suppose, by our generous Patreon supporters. So, until next time when we talk to you about Star Trek 4, I'm Annie. I'm Kit. And I'm Mac. And we have fought you.